Okay, we've got a great panel to kick things off here for day two of Accelerate. Uh, we've got a women in leadership panel. This is going to be fantastic here. And I'm going to introduce our moderator here in just a second. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of Girlquake, which is a platform to amplify voices of emerging women and girls in leadership. She's also a Forbes podcast host. So please welcome to day two of Accelerate. Give it up for Denise Ristori. everyone and thank you all for being here. I hear there was some partying going on last night. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for being here. You know, as, as we were just being introduced about women and amplifying their voices and women in leadership, women, power, women, leadership, there's one thing that I am sure of, and there's a lot that I'm not sure of in this world and today, today in this day and age, but the one thing I'm sure of and all three, uh, well, all four of us do this every day, is we're taking action. We quit talking about what isn't working, and we're actually saying, what can we do? What are the actions we can take to change what isn't working? And so today, we're going to have a real conversation, just like if we were sitting at my dinner table or my breakfast table. And we're inviting you to be a part of that, to share in this conversation with us. And it's not that Q&A bounce back of, you know, so Tiffany, what did you think? It really is a conversation. So to start it off, let's introduce you, let's meet everyone you're going to be hearing from today. So Tiffany Schlein is a filmmaker. She is a, she's a TED Talk, she's done TED Talks. She is the founder of the Webby Awards. And I love this. Every Friday night, Tiffany and her family take a technical Shabbat until Saturday night. And she has teenagers, which I just think is <laughs> remarkable, <laughs> that they disconnect from all technology. Now, when I asked her about this and I said, you know, I want to do that, but how do I do that? I have a 90-year-old mother and a 24-year-old daughter. And she said, well, if it's important, they'll call me on my landline. To which I thought, that's what I'm missing, a landline. <laughs> <laughs> and I barely right. have one anyway. Right. <laughs> so we, act, we pulled Tiffany away from something that is very near and dear to her heart right now and very timely. So let's take a look at what that is. We literally like pulled her away from this. So can we show the Tiffany video? Join us for 5050 Day May 10th, where thousands of events around the globe will have film screenings and discussions, and they'll all be linked together by a global Q&A, all talking about how to get to a more gender-balanced world. We're at such a critical moment in the history of gender equality, and now's the time we need to step it up even more. There have been over 300 studies that prove that more gender balance in all sectors of society business, culture, politics, and the home make it better for everyone, not just women, everyone. Over half of the countries that rank highest in gender equality across different sectors also rank highest on the Global Happiness Index. One of the priorities for you was to have a cabinet that was gender balanced. Why was that so important to you? Because it's 2015. <laughs> And this conversation is just as relevant for men as it is for women. Men have centuries of expectations to wrestle with too. 50-50 isn't just about women getting more power. It's about everyone getting more power. It's about opening up the whole idea of what power is, moving beyond the binaries of men and women. We're all on a continuum with different combinations of strengths to bring to the table. Power is leadership, but power is also love. Power is empathy. Power is the opportunity to find your own path. So how do we really get there to the world we want to see?
Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank it's you. a busy week. Let's just put it out. <laughs> so we literally pulled <laughs> I her away. I got up at three in the morning yesterday. Last <laughs> night I finally slept, but yes. And it's a great example, though, Tiffany, of your taking action and saying, because so often we're having that conversation, right, about gender equality and how are we getting there? Well, on May 10th, we can all be a part of it, and every day we can all be a part of us getting there. And now meet Jane Chen. Jane is a Forbes under 30. She's a young global leader of the World Economic Forum, a TED speaker, a TED fellow, and she's passionate about surfing, and she connects those dots <laughs> between life lessons and surfing, like tenacity and mm. focus, and the ability to learn through our mistakes. And, 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 she's the founder and CEO of Embrace Innovations, and we're gonna take a look at what that means. I am the CEO and co-founder of Embrace Innovations. We are a social enterprise that aims to help vulnerable babies all over the world. The Embrace Infant Warmer was developed by my team and I to help vulnerable babies in the developing world. An incubator is often what's required to keep these babies stable. But for millions of mothers, traditional incubators just aren't an option. The Embrace Infant Warmer creates a warm microenvironment for an infant. The core technology is a wax-like substance that when heated maintains a constant temperature for up to eight hours at a stretch. We started working with this Beijing orphanage. They found a less than two pound baby that was abandoned. They brought him in and kept him in the warmer and they told me it was the first time a baby of that size had ever survived in the orphanage. After that, we got the note saying, we've adopted this little boy and, and thank you for saving his life. He was just so happy to be alive. He's grateful, he may not be able to say it or express it right now, but just in who he is, he lives life with abandon. To help us fund the expansion of the Embrace Warmers, we recently launched a new line of products called Little Lotus, a collection of swaddles, sleeping bags, and blankets for babies. They use similar technology as the Embrace Warmers to help keep babies at an optimal temperature. For every product sold, a baby will be helped by the Embrace Infant Warmer in a developing country. I love that you're so noisy. <laughs> keep being noisy. And Jane, thank you. When I first met Jane, I was like, you're doing what? <laughs> it's like, in a good way, like being like totally impressed. And meet Dom. Dom Brassi is the, I have to get your title right here, the Vice President of Growth for Lesbians Who Tech. Lesbian Who's, Lesbians Who Tech is a global network of 25,000 queer women in tech. Before Lesbians Who Tech, she was, I love this, you were a gender non-conforming menswear model. And you, I mean, I was, you just look like a model. You are a model, you are a model. And, of the, and this is the best, though. You were a veteran prisoner educator. And tell us where, because not just like any prison. Right across the bridge, San Quentin State Prison. San Quentin, that, that is just amazing. So let's take a look at what Dom and Lesbians Who Tech are up to. This is all about us. I come to Lesbians Who Tech because these are my people. You can just be yourself. You can be in the tech, you can be media, you can be a badass, you can be in finance, and there's a place for everyone. In any movement for change, it always begins with a hub of like-minded people coming together, gaining strength from each other, and then bursting out to change the mainstream. A community of people that say, what I do matters, and who I am, it's something to be celebrated. Mm. <laughs> so this shows what they do, but behind that, who are they? Who are we? Why are we doing what we do? What motivates all of us up here to as Tiffany said, get up at 3 a.m. to be able to go out and do one more thing to make that change. So this now gets into our storytelling and our conversation. Now that you've met everyone and know what we do, who are we? 
And we're going to kick that off with a story from Tiffany. And we, none of us know what the stories are. We're prepped with these, there are no <laughs> questions on here. We're prepped with nothing that we're planning because this really is a fluid conversation. Except there's one thing I do want to kick this off with that will give you a little insight into who Tiffany is. It's a tweetable quote, so you can pull out your iPhones, your phones, your tablets, and you can start typing here. If you're not living on the edge, you're taking up way too much space. Yeah. That was by my dad, my late father, Leonard Schlein. That was his motto, which I think all of his kids have carried on. And can you repeat it one more time so everybody if can catch it? If you're not living on the edge, you're taking up way too much space. <laughs> so um, Tiffany, give dad. us your story, an aha moment in your life. OK. An aha moment in my life, I was running the Webby Awards, and you were just about to be able to show web, uh, film on the web. And I had made a, a film for Planned Parenthood called Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. And I, YouTube had just started. And I thought, if I could marry my social activist work with the web, with the power of film, that will change everything. So that's the year I sold the Webbies, which was about 10 years ago, and started my film studio in San Francisco. Um, so that was a, a big light bulb moment for me, because I was always into tech and I was always into filmmaking, but that really merged those two worlds. And then I think the other one was 50, 50 days started because I met a woman who convened women presidents and prime ministers. At a talk like this, we're backstage, I'm whispering to her, what do you do? She said, I convene like the women presidents and prime ministers, I've been doing it for 20 years. I thought, well, that's an amazing thing to do. <laughs> How many were there 20 years ago? Thinking there was like, I don't know, three or four that I could think of. And she said, oh, there was around 15. I was like, huh. How many are there today? She was like, around 50. And I was like, 50? How did I not know that? I'm a feminist. I know my women's history. And then I proceeded to ask every powerful man and woman I knew that question. No one knew it. And it made me think, I think we're telling the story of scarcity. All the things we're not. We're this percent mm -hmm. of this. We're this mm -hmm. percent. And we're not telling also the story of courage, courage and we need to f change the framework and know our history more because that's going to fuel us to get to 50-50. Mm. So that's what started me making that film. That film, 50-50, Rethinking the Past, Present, and Future of Women in Power. And it looks at the 10,000-year history of women in power in 20 minutes. It premiered two weeks before the election and uh, at TED Women. And the morning after the election, with tears in my eyes, I thought, I want to start a global conversation about what it's going to take to get to 50-50. So that's when it started. We have almost 10,000 screenings happening in 55 countries and almost all 50 states. We need one in West Virginia and South Dakota, if anyone knows anyone in the 50 states. <laughs> Anybody from West Virginia or South Dakota? <laughs> like, I don't know anyone there. Anyways, but it was really my, that was like a second big moment is it felt like we were going backwards the day after the election and we're not. And we need to have a global conversation about what it's gonna take to really get to 50-50. Equal opportunities for everyone. Thank you. And if you, you all have to watch the movie. It's it's free. It's free. It's free. And it's 50, online. 50 Day is free. Yeah, Sign so up for companies. There, they, yeah. This is not like you know go online and pay us twenty nine ninety nine. <laughs> this is all free, um, and it's really remarkable. And you'll walk away with, as Tiffany said, how did I not know that? Mm -hmm. So Jane, give us your story. That uh, well, let's let's take a rec and let's talk about Tiffany's story for a second. Let's anybody want to start the conversation off with Tiffany's story? Anything, any questions you have, any thoughts? What's your ultimate vision for where this goes? Um, my ultimate vision is that I think the big picture is I believe in humanity. And I say that because in the last four months there's been a lot of questions around that. But I believe that when you have a meaningful experience, it changes you. Mm -hmm. And I, I really believe, especially in our distracted culture, that film can really do that. And then providing, you, when you sign up, everything's free, you get a free discussion kit that goes through each of the buckets of, it's not just equal pay we're talking about, we're talking about everything. There's like 20 circles in that, under home, politics, business, they're all there. And how do you really move the needle forward on the conversation? So my goal, see I have a lot of friends that they're focusing on what is equal pay or health or whatever, culture. I wanna bring it under all one umbrella, aggregate the conversation, and say, let's talk about it all and move it forward. So my real goal is that we actually have come a very, very far away, and we can't forget that. We're in that last stretch, I feel like. 
I think the whole revolution around gender is part of that. I think we almost, we did have a popular vote wanting to elect a woman president. Um, and like it said in the trailer, there are so many studies that show if you get more diversity on boards, at companies, in every aspect, it's going to improve society. And I, I'm, I want to see that for my two daughters' lifetime and for my lifetime. And I have a question, and because someone just was talking, we were talking about getting a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. And someone gave me this great quote, and she said, sometimes you have to build the chair. <laughs> <laughs> and the table. And the table, right? <laughs> to get a seat at the table. Yeah. What keeps you going? Well, you know, I have to say, I had two feminist parents, my mom and dad. I actually, and I was one of the only women in tech when I founded the Webbies. Mm -hmm. I'm usually, as a woman film director, it's not like there's tons. I've never felt like it was a disadvantage. I have to tell you that I've felt like it was an advantage to be a woman. And, um, I've, and actually, I feel like that's why I don't have any, the only agenda that I have is that we all have more equal opportunities. And I feel like I was really lucky to have two feminist parents, but I know a lot of my friends that didn't. And I feel like we're at this evolving place where there just needs to be more balance. If the world feels imbalanced to me right now on like a deep level, and it needs to be righted. And you're not alone, obviously. You're not alone in that. I mean, it's just, um, <laughs> we're all there. Now we're gonna go to Jane's story, and then we're gonna circle back to all of this. So Jane, give us your story, that aha moment. Sure, so I think my first aha moment happened when I was around 23. Um, I was fresh out of college, went into management consulting, and it was something that was, intellectually challenging, but not necessarily something I was passionate mm -hmm. about. And I knew I wanted to do something with more meaning. Uh, so one day I read an article in the New York Times, and it was about the AIDS epidemic in China, in central China. Uh, basically in the 90s, millions of poor farmers had contracted HIV through selling their blood. Uh, but the way the blood was collected was completely unsanitary. Mm -hmm. So they would basically collect people's blood, pool it together, separate the plasma, which was what was needed, and then re-inject every person with the remaining red blood cells in the belief that they could generate blood again more quickly. So as a result of this, in the places I ended up working in, 60 to 80% of the adult population was HIV positive. Wow. And these people were um, dying without access to even the most basic health care. And there was something about that where a bulb in my head kind of went off, and I realized that we have all won the, the genetic lottery. You know, we're the luckiest people on this earth. But I could have easily been born into a different life and, and suffered this horrible um, fate as a result of that. Um, so I decided in that moment that I wanted to use the opportunities that I had been given to help people in need. I quit my job, I moved to China, I worked with a startup nonprofit that was providing help to the orphans who had been left behind. Millions of orphans had been left behind in these areas, um, and most of them were not HIV positive. So we sponsored their educational fees, we sponsored them to go to school. Um, and by the end of my two years there, uh, we had helped thousands of students receive an education, but more importantly, the government stepped up, partially as a result of our visibility efforts, and began to provide free education to all of the affected children in those areas, and free antiretroviral medication to um, all of the HIV-positive people. So it was an amazing experience, because I was able to see that with a small group of really dedicated people, we had three people on our team, that we were able to affect social change in a big way. So that led me to get my MBA at Stanford. Um, and my first year there, I took a class at the design school called Design for Extreme Affordability. Yes. And that <laughs> combines uh, students with all the different graduate programs to create technologies for people living on less than a dollar a day. So my team was incredible. I worked with a PhD in electrical engineering, a computer science master's, an aerospace engineer. And the challenge that was given to us was build a baby incubator that costs less than 1% of what a traditional incubator costs, mm. which in the US is $20,000. Mm. So that took us to places like India and Nepal. And I remember um, one of the first women I met in a village in South India, Sujata. She had given birth to her baby two months prematurely, taken her baby to a village doctor who said, you need to go to a city hospital so your baby can be placed in an incubator. That hospital was over four hours away she didn't have the money to get there, mm. and so her baby died. Mm. 
And since then, I've heard dozens of similar stories. And it was that story that made us realize what was needed was not just a lower cost version of the technology that sits in the US. What we needed was something that worked without electricity, that's easy enough for a mother or a midwife to use. And that's how we came up with the Embrace Incubator, which you saw in the film and I have here. But this looks like a little sleeping bag for a baby. And the primary function of incubators are for temperature regulation. So the way we do that is through this wax. This is called a phase change material. It's a wax-like substance that has a melting point of human body temperature, 98 degrees. You can heat this with boiling water or with a short burst of electricity. And once it melts, it maintains the exact same temperature for eight hours at a stretch. And you can reheat this thousands and thousands of times. Hmm. You just place this into a little pocket here, and that creates a warm microenvironment for the baby. Um, so really simple, effective technology. Uh, I moved to India with my team at, right after Stanford. India is home to 40% uh, of all the world's premature babies. Mm -hmm. And today, almost 10 years later, we have helped over 200,000 babies across 22 countries. And our next goal is to reach a million babies. And so that's the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got a fan. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So that, uh, that just leads me to the last piece of the story here. About a year ago, uh, we were looking at models like Tom Shoes and Warby Parker, and we thought, why not take our technology and put it into a product for the US market and use the proceeds from that to fund our work in developing countries? And so that's our newest initiative. It's called Little Lotus Baby, everyone here as well. Um, but these are little swaddles and sleep sacks for babies. Um, the fabric on the inside is akin to the technology in our incubators. So it's lined with microns of wax, which absorb and release heat to keep babies at the ideal skin temperature, thereby helping with sleep. So we found in a study that 80% of babies Could slept. That. Yes. <laughs> where was that? Well, when I was okay, well, help. where is that for us, though? <laughs> we need a big one for us. Yeah, exactly. That's your next right. market. Right. Absolutely. We're going to go into adult right. products as well. I would so mind, we'll like, all be sleeping better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, sleep. I actually sleep with this fabric. It's amazing. Um, but, yes, yeah. Oh, it's like jersey. It's like jersey, and it's so yeah. soft. So we'll all be jumping inside. into this in a minute now. Yeah. Um, but we found in a study that 80% of babies did sleep almost an hour longer a day with this product versus oh my a regular cotton product in the market. Amazing. Um, and then for every one of these we sell, we help save a baby in a developing country. So. Great. Yeah. As I said to you, when I first met Jane, I was like, what? <laughs> in a very, very positive way. <laughs> like, you're doing what? Mm. So anybody have questions for Jane? Well, well I, I guess the starting point of that project. So this was just an instructor who threw the challenge out? Yeah, well, they had partnered with a nonprofit in Nepal who identified okay. a lack of incubators as this huge problem. So they took it to multiple universities and they oh. said, help us find a solution. And in this design, which I love the extreme affordability, was yeah. there just, you know, there's teams working on various yeah. projects also, but the teacher must be so, they must be so happy. Right. <laughs> they <laughs> realize the challenge. That's so exciting. Well, it's, it's also really cool that the whole team stayed together for so long. Every, Do you still work together? Well, no, it's 10 years now, but for the first like five or six years, and also everyone moved to India, so we all lived in India for the next four years Amazing. getting this wow. on the ground. So, yeah. so great. I love and it. I think you can see, and you're going to see even more when Dom, um, I don't know what her story is, but just in what you do and who you are, is that none of this is easy. Right? None of it's easy, the work that we're all doing, the work that you're doing isn't easy. None of it's easy to get to where that step, and I hope one of the things that we give you today is that message of it doesn't have to be easy. It would be great if it was, but maybe not, you know, and it's, it's that, it, it's, it's not easy and we can conquer the things that aren't easy. We can fix some of the most vexing problems in the world mm -hmm. when we take action. So Dom, tell us your story, that aha moment. <laughs> My story. I think a lot of people ask me how I ended up throwing fabulous, amazing parties for queer professional women for a full-time paid job. <laughs> They're like, how do I do that? How do I get that? Um, because in our community, a lot of folks are, and this is like the LGBTQ community, a lot of our folks have what they call a day job and a gay job. And your day job is like what you do to make a living. Mm -hmm. And your gay job is what you do on behalf of your community to sort of be out and be visible, be a leader and help interpret things. Um, and how I got to have a full-time 
gay job was, I think I, I, I always started in tech. I was always behind a computer working on an e-commerce website or some you know, sheets, making things work. And the experience of actually talking to people was how I kind of kept my soul alive. I was like, I need to have a, a paying job, and I need to have a soul-feeding job. So one day when I was working on this e-commerce website, I met somebody doing a management program who came in to visit and sort of see the guts of our organization. And they were an entrepreneur. They were this very interesting, very cocky, uh, like very butch lesbian entrepreneur. And I was like, I think I need to know this person. They just had that charisma. And um, I was not very much longer working for the e-commerce website. I actually partnered up with this entrepreneur. And we started a um, tour across the United States selling their product, which was gender nonconforming menswear. And what that means is uh, menswear is very sculpted to the body. So I taught women and gender nonconforming people how to wear the suits that we made that actually fit our bodies, small shoulders, wide hips, a little something here. Um, and the experience of going across the nation, talking to so many different gender nonconforming people, like you know, Chicago, Minneapolis, Dallas, anywhere there's a lot, like a high concentration of lesbians. We actually did the math and found out like demographically where people live. And I got to talk to everybody about this experience of not feeling like they belong or like they had power, like they were hiding something because of the experience of having difficulty just putting on the clothes they felt like represented their gender uh, and represented themselves. Because ultimately, you don't go to work as a fashion show. You know, you get dressed so that people will look at your slides. Like, you get dressed so that people will listen to what you're saying and believe in your ideas. And the experience of doing this uh, was also really hard to sell to a market that has a that has a depressed income. If you have two gay men, they typically have like two male incomes, which tends to be a little bit higher. And sometimes when we tell straight women that two women, when we get married, or like, lesbians are actually on the whole opposite side of the spectrum. We tend to have uh, much less money. And so trying to sell a really fabulous custom product to, to our market was actually really challenging. And a lot of our market was also trans. Um, so like even further on the spectrum, for real. And after the experience of selling these suits and watching the business go under, as much as I loved it and as much as we did for the community, um, I ran into this person, Leanne Pittsford, who started this organization, Lesbians Who Tech, after the experience of uh, working at Equality California and seeing that gay men, during the struggle for marriage equality in California, Prop 8, gay men gave six times as much money hmm. and gay women staffed six hmm. times as many positions. And there was a huge inequity between who was working how to make that movement happen. And it blew her mind. And she started the organization to sort of create a platform for people to be comfortable in their identity and to actually find leadership in our identity, not in being marginal, uh, but in finding each other, building mentorship and relationships, and creating a culture where pride is a part of our culture and we work hard to understand and build our culture so that we have something to share that we're really proud of. And, and that, that, is a, that is a wonderful story. And what you're doing is, if you all aren't familiar with Lesbians Who Tech, it really is a wonderful organization. I know Leanne. And, and I have a question, Dom. What are some of the biggest obstacles right now that your community is facing? If you could, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot. Oh. I'm sure there is a lot. Um, but if you could take two, three, like what are some of the big things that if you could change, but you, or, or that you are taking action now to change? Yes. Number one thing is the number of people of color, people of LGBTQ orientation, gender nonconforming people, uh, military veterans, people with disabilities, the community that represents like diversity, like we don't have enough this, we don't have enough this, there are not enough women on our engineering team, why are there no, you know, why, why don't we have enough black people on our engineering team? All these diversity conversations in tech, what our organization is looking at is the number of extremely diverse people, career changers, women, queer folks, people of color, who have great tech skills, 
but don't actually have a four-year computing, like a four-year CS degree or an engineering degree, it tends to be that people, uh, people in my community usually go through different paths. Usually, you know, you get an internship and you, you go from the help desk team to like working in IT to being the director of IT and then not being able to progress to the next mm -hmm. part of your career. And so something that we're working on is trying to make talent within the industry more intelligible and get rid of things like the four-year CS degree and find other ways to uh, make, our, make, make people um, aware of like you can, you can do the job, but you can't get the job. Right now, that's the problem we're trying to solve, the intelligibility of non-traditional talent. Hmm. That is huge. And we, were, and we were texting last night about pronouns. And, and, and I think this is really important because I think a lot of this falls under that, how did I not know that or how am I not thinking about that? You know, why isn't this top of mind? And I think part of being leaders are informing and educating all of us, right, to what the things we don't know about. Tiffany, your film wouldn't have a film if, there, if it wasn't saying, how did I not know that? But you know, one thing about the word 50-50, because to me it's incredibly strong and powerful in the name, because it is the goal is in the name. But one thing we always are really clear is we have the tagline, a more gender balanced world for everyone, and everyone's on a continuum we have in the trailer because we didn't want it to feel like male and female 50-50 because that's not what we're saying. To me, when I hear the word 50-50, I think equality. And, well, I think of a lot of things with 50-50, but that's the biggest one, but that's something we've been really sensitive about because it's not about a binary thing, it is about a more balance. And so that is something, and my producer who I've worked with for 11 years was a woman when I hired her and now is a man. We made a whole movie about it called Trans Boom. So this issue is something I have intimately, because he's you know one of the people I talk to like eight times a day. And um, so it's been a fascinating experience and I love just in that 11 years how popular culture has embraced, and as we all know, even with um, you know popular culture and TV shows, that stuff moves culture. That's a big reason why I'm a filmmaker, yes. is you can really move ideas through um, film and television. And, and, and so you just gave me a perfect segue into this, and not even knowing, I mean, <laughs> you're like, you, that wasn't on purpose. Because what we were talking about last night were the pronouns. So Dom said that she uses the pronouns she and her. So can you talk to us about that? Because I think that's really important to understand and know, and that kind of goes to what you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jane, you just smiled too. Are you familiar with the pronouns conversation? Yeah, I'm yeah. About that. <laughs> so, it was, so I had one of those moments, like how do I not know that? Yeah, it's, so the, our organization is called Lesbians Who Tech, and we get a lot of flack within the, within the queer community, because people are like, hey, lesbians are like women-identified people, and our community is actually much more inclusive. We include trans people, non-binary people, gender non-conforming people, and allies. People who are just like, I'm down. Like, whatever's good for queer women is going to be good for me, so I'm all right with that. <laughs> and the pronouns thing is something in Lesbians Who Tech that we had to learn more about be to be better allies to our trans people. So when you introduce yourself, when I introduce myself, I say, I'm Don Brassi, I'm vice president of growth for Lesbians Who Tech, and I use the pronouns she and her. I have it in my email signature, too. Oh. And the, it feels awkward. No, it's funny, when first. I got introduced and I said her, and then I caught myself and thought, maybe you don't go by her. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. Right, and that's, right. <laughs> and that's why it was one of those moments of like, it's, information is power. Yeah. And the more information we have, the better leaders and the better people we can be. So I'm gonna give you another tweetable quote here. And this one's from, Ch this one's from Jane. When you truly believe something, the universe will conspire to help you achieve it. Yes. And that's Paulo Coelho. That's yeah. That's <laughs> I was like, I thought you just said that. <laughs> and, and that's not your dad. <laughs> not <laughs> my dad. Tiffany's dad. <laughs> so, Jim, why is that quote important to you? Um, I think it goes back to what you said, Tiffany, and that you believe in, in humanity, and I do as well. And I've seen mm. that time again in my work is when I put an intention out there um, people have responded to that, and we have received support from people from all walks of life. You know, we started as students not knowing where this would go, and I just feel so blessed um, to have so many, you know, people have joined us on this journey mm. to get us to, to where we are. So but don't you think that's about, I mean, it seems like the link, I think with all four of us, is that we find incredible meaning with what we do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like, that's the starting point. If you really, like, 
what gets me up at three in the morning is that it's meaningful. Like it, I, there were times in my life where I got up that early and it wasn't, and then that's just <laughs> stressful. But when I'm excited because I have so much that gives meaning to me and I think others, and it's also from abundance, that abundance will, like if you come from a place of meaning, abundance will surround you. And also if you look at the world from abundance, you're more likely to get to more abundance than if you come at the world from scarcity and what you don't have. Absolutely, yeah, completely but, agree with that. But how do you get to that point? So how do we get to the point of meaning? Being, of the point of meaning, yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's always, I mean, if you talk to any of your friends, you see when they get excited. Mm -hmm. Like if, my, if I ever have friends that are in career moments where they're, you know, like what, Gets their, what gets them excited? And it, it might be like a side thing. Like mm -hmm. You should be doing, you need to figure out how to wrap your life around that thing. And um, I always think that if you really talk to someone and listen, so get a good friend to say, what do you think I find, if you can't find it? I mean, a lot of us know what we find meaningful. Some people are still searching what that thing is. And I just did a podcast with Agapi Stasinopoulos, who is Ariana Huffington's sister. And mm. she, do, she just did a book on meditation. And one of the things she was saying is she met this woman named Jackie, and Jackie said, you know, I'm a lawyer, I'm really successful, but I hate my job, I hate my job. And how often do we hear that, or do we feel that, right? I'm really successful, I went to school to do this, uh, you know, X amount of years, my parents invested all of this money, I invested all of this yeah. time, and now I hate what I'm doing. And so she had said to Jackie, you know, what would happen if you were diagnosed, God forbid, if you were diagnosed with cancer tomorrow? Would you quit your job? Would you take care of yourself? You, you, might, you know, depending on your financial, but in theory, that would yeah. give you that pause moment to say, I need to get out of here. So she said to her, take a sabbatical. And Jackie was in the position to take a six week sabbatical. She had the money to do that. And so Agapi said, I know there will be some people who will be listening to this and they'll be like, I'll get fired. I mean, they, my company won't give me a sabbatical. And so her response was, then take Sunday off, okay? <laughs> and she sounds just like Ariana Huffington. The <laughs> voices are very similar. So if you can hear that, like, so take Sunday off. Just take something off. You take mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times it's taking that moment mm -hmm. where we can actually pause and say, what, what do I really want to be doing mm -hmm. that we don't sometimes do? Um, but do you all find that? that you, you fall into that. I think sometimes when you love what you're doing, sometimes you reach that point mm -hmm. of being burnt out and not loving what you're doing, or just wanting to do something else. The work that I did in San Quentin State Prison yeah. was what I did to restore myself mm. after my nine to five. So you have your nine to five, and then you have your five to nine. And for a lot of people, five to nine is family and kids. Mm. But when I was going to school, my opportunity was to make my five to nine going in and working in the college program and teaching people how to read mm. and how to move through the emotional, psychological, spiritual awareness of their like, shame of not being able to read, of being 43 or 52 or 36 and actually really not knowing how to understand words on a page mm. and having somebody call out like you're misinterpreting that sentence oh. let's go through it again and be extremely gentle mm. and for me it was unpaid work but I did it for seven years because it taught me to be a better person and to be rooted in what do I actually care about it was great work it was the best thing I mean and, and I learned so much from incarcerated men who have to learn how to be extremely peaceful because they're surrounded by harm mm. right. in many ways. Yeah, I was going to say that at certain moments of my life, I've done kind of intensive classes. So I'm still doing whatever the life is. And, and in, like those three day class, like weekend, which you can do if you have a job, but doing something that's totally different, even if you want to learn how to cook or a weekend sculpting class or go to Esalen for the week or whatever <laughs> it is. But I, if I look at moments in my life that have been really transformative, it usually comes after one of those intensive classes. Doing something that I don't normally do, it always yeah. kind of shakes me out of my situation if I need to get out of it. Right. So that, and that you can really do, um, you can really do if you, have a nine, if you have a job. 
And, and Jane, is that surfing for you? It is, <laughs> I was gonna say surfing and, and meditation. A few years ago, I did a 10 day silent meditation that completely Where changed my life. Um, it's a Goenka style, I did it in Hawaii, and yeah. I highly recommend it. It just really <laughs> shifted my perspective yeah. around a lot of things and allowed me to pause. And I'd been doing this work very intensely for seven, eight years at that point. Mm. Um, so that was really important part, and a very important part of my journey. Um, and around the same time, I discovered surfing, which I've become completely obsessed with. And this is an amazing area to <laughs> surf. Um, but I love it because the waves force me to be totally present um, and, and clear my mind of uh, kind of any stress, but also teach me about life in general. And it's interesting because there's a lot of parallels between these two things for me. So meditation, much of it, in my mind, is rooted in this idea mm. of an, an impermanence. Everything in this world is constantly changing. So don't be mm. attached to anything and also be totally present. Nothing teaches you this lesson more than being in the ocean where your conditions are constantly changing. Mm. And so I think that kind of mentality also allows me to be really flexible um, in the work that I do and the strategies we take. We're constantly pivoting and trying new things and not being attached to an end outcome is a really important part of that. I think you need to write a business book about how surfing taught me how to like. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm going just, to. I'm, I, no, I started I'm it. I'm telling you, just as you were talking, it's such a great way to, think about being flexible to changing environments. And that ne I don't think I've seen that book, and that <laughs> book needs to be written. <laughs> like. And one of the things that I love whenever we have great women joining together on stage is what happens after they leave. <laughs> and I can see a documentary coming out of this. <laughs> it's like they meet, and then they do more and more action. And that is great. I'm going to give you one more tweetable quote, and this one is from Dom. And this is a great way for us to end because it kind of covers every, what we were just talking about. You can discover more about a person in an hour of play than in a year of conversation. Hmm. So that is our final tweetable quote. Not that you haven't had many tweetable quotes from today. Plato. But I, I, I want to wrap this up with, tell us where we can find you and how can anybody who wants to be a part of what you're doing be a part of what you're doing? So, Dom, we'll start with you. I'll say we're going to be in New York on May 10th, hopefully showing some of Tiffany's film. Uh, go to lesbiansutech.org. That's it, lesbiansutech.org. And no matter who you are, how your gender is, uh, sign up for Bring a Lesbian to Work Day. It means uh, it's a one-day speed mentoring program that's meant to be 100% not awkward. <laughs> and if you bring awkwardness to it, that's OK, too. But the whole purpose of our doing it is to build human connections where there just weren't human connections before. So you don't have to be a lesbian, but you can bring a lesbian to work. I love that. Wait, when is Bring a Lesbian to Work Day? What day? What? what day is it? Oh, no, Bring a Lesbian to Work Day happens all the time. Oh, any day. We just sign up and we pair people and we just right. enjoy. I love that. <laughs> and Jane, that. where can we find you and what can, what can everyone do if they want to be a part of what you're doing? You can check out embraceinnovations.com. Our newest product is called Little Lotus Baby, and that's the website as well. Um, and we recently started a corporate partnership program where we're Ooh. partnering with companies who are gifting the Little Lotus products to all of their employees uh, who have a new baby. So companies like Salesforce and Ernst & Young and Marketo have joined this program and would love to ask you guys to encourage your companies to consider that as well. It, it provides a great uh, employee benefit and also helps us in our mission to save a million babies around the world. Hmm. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, okay. We know where to find Tiffany on May 10th. Well, today is the last day. It, first of all, we have you know all the tech company, every company. There's a lot in the Bay Area, but around the country, it's the last day where you can sign up and get the free poster and discussion kit, which are really cool. Keep them up at your company all year round, so everyone just looks at that <laughs> every day. And it's all free. And be that ambassador that says, "I'm signing up my company." Go to HR. Go to the head of the company. It's a hot topic, so no, everyone has said yes. And, um, and I think you'll find the experience exciting. We have amazing speakers, and it is an interesting model where everyone's having their own event, and they're all linked together, and you're definitely going to be a part of it in New York event. Um, and it's just 50-50day.org, and I hope you all sign up. And thank you for, I mean, thank all of you for thank your, you. your work. Yeah. Thank you. Where yes, can, thank can, you. You're welcome. Well, where can you find me? I don't need this. Where can you find me? You can just 
my, I have a podcast she has called a great Mentoring podcast. Moments. Tiffany was on it. Um, a podcast called Mentoring Moments with Forbes. And I want to leave you all with this message. You know, it's something that I end every podcast with, and I say, you know, until next week, keep sharing your stories because your stories do matter, just like their stories matter. We all have those stories, and if you don't, then create a life with those stories. Whatever it is you're doing that has purpose and meaning, create those stories. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. And everyone have a wonderful day.